Hey Don Bennett, so you're obviously a living legend and a pioneer in this movement and so thank you so much for, I just wanted to ask you a few questions. First of all, how old are you? I am, uh, wait, wait, don't tell me, don't tell me. <laughs> Uh, 37. Uh, 60, wait. 67. I don't, I actually, I don't I thought, track it. I, sometimes I had to actually figure it out and figure out what's the date in the driver's life because I don't, it's just a number, but 67 chronologically. It's so hard to tell here, Don, because everyone looks at least 10 years younger. Like, it's so hard to know how old people are, but okay, 67, which is incredible. And um, so now, when did you start this raw vegan lifestyle? How old were you? I would say I was around 19 or 20. Not not the not for the vegan raw lifestyle, but I just saw people in my family uh, living to over 100 in relatively good health, and people dying at 65 in horrible, horrible health. And you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize well, what's the difference because I want to go that way. I don't want to go that way. Uh, so I started looking, and observing. I'm a very observant person, as a lot of people know. And I saw, well, they were living, you know, very healthfully. They're not eating, my grandparents not eating a lot of meat. Huh, that's interesting. And the other side of the family, meat, 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 right? Mm. So um, I said, all right, so I'm going to try eating more like them or thinking more like them. And then I started doing some research. Now, it wasn't easy to do in those days. There was no internet and public libraries, no help. But you'd figure things out. And I'm like, wait a second. All right, we were hunter-gatherers, yeah. But what, were we anything before we were hunter-gatherers? Well, yeah, we were foragers. Well, what were we foraging for? Well, just probably what we could eat from the, you know, well, what, about our, what about doing it with our closest relative in the animal kingdom, which I thought was the chimpanzee at the time, and I was wrong. Uh, so, but I said, well, they don't really eat meat like we're eating meat today. I said, how about this? I'm going to try not eating meat. He said, oh, you're becoming vegan, my friend said. Mm. Vegan? Yeah, what, what's that? Yeah. Well, that's somebody who doesn't eat animal products. I'm like, cool, woohoo. When you were 1920? Yes, yeah, yeah, something wow. like that. Yeah, yes. it's been a long time, almost half a century, I guess. More that must have been very weird back then. Oh, oh tell me about it. <laughs> so you went vegan. I went vegan, and then, so now I'm vegan. And I, but I'm still cooking stuff. And one day I burned my hand on the stove, and I, it was an aha moment for me. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, step back, step back. I shouldn't be damaged by eating my diet. So this can't be my diet. It was just very logical figuring things out because there was no one that I knew teaching this stuff at the time. Yeah. It took him almost half a century ago. So, and I didn't know about the self-published books because back then to self-publish to self-publish a book was like a monumentous task. <laughs> Where would you find out about them? There was, was no internet. Yes. So I said, all right, I'm going to try not eating anything I have to cook. It was just logic. I was just using logic to figure this out. I'm going to try just not eating anything that I. That, that has to be cooked. I'm just gonna eat what I don't have to cook. And I made that decision. And I said, oh, what am I gonna eat? What am I gonna eat? Well, all right, calm down, calm down. There's things, there's gotta be things because we didn't cook our, we couldn't have been cooking our food many millennia ago. So calm the F down and just figure it out. Yes. Uh, and a little voice said, you like fruit? I said, yeah, yeah, I like fruit. Well, stop eating it as a snack and try it as a meal. What? I'm like, okay. Sure. This is just coming to you. Oh, you yeah, didn't have, yeah. you didn't read logic. the books. You know, my, my favorite character growing up as a little kid on TV was Mr. Spock of Star Trek <laughs> because he was so logical and there was no issues. He just handled everything unemotionally. He, no one could get him to argue with them and I hated arguing. So I'm like, okay, logic, logic, logic. And my mom taught me, think with my brain, not with other people's brains. Okay, cool. Uh, so I said, all right, fruit. So let's eat fruit. But is fruit, yeah, well, you know, our closest cousins eat a lot of fruit. They eat some greens and stuff. Let me try doing that. And then it just took off. And then, then so I was telling somebody about how I lived. And they said, you're one of those natural hygienists. Mm. I'm like, what the hell is that? What's that? And he goes, oh, it's those people who eat like you do. They don't eat anything cooked. I'm like, get out of here. Because I thought I was one of like 12 people in the world who figured this out, right? How am I going to meet those other 12 people? Impossible. <laughs> so I'm going to be alone doing this. But I'm very independent, so I didn't care. So he goes, oh, yeah, they're meeting over at Hofstra University in Nassau County. They're, they do meetings, you know, conventions. I'm like, get out. Oh, yeah, where did you live when you were doing this? This is New York. New York. Yeah, New York. So I wow. um, okay. went there, and there were like 90 natural hygienists, people who figured it out also. And there were books on the table. I'm like, what? books. <laughs> and I just opened up my wallet and started pouring it on the table. I mean, give me, give me, give me those books, give me those books. Books by Herbert Shelton, T.C. Fry, all the old guard, old guard, you know. Um, learning, learning, learning. But, you know, 
Does it mean what they're teaching is 100% accurate? What if it's 98%? What if they miss something? So I got taught to learn as a researcher, not as a student. That's very important. That's why we tell all you guys, learn as a researcher, not as a student. Don't learn from just one person. Because what if that person is teaching 90% super accurate information? Well, then you're going to be learning 10% inaccurate information. You don't know it. Maybe they don't even know it. All right. So learn from yes. lots, of, lots of sources so you can find the conflicting information. Now, that sounds counterintuitive, but be happy when you find it because that, uh, researchers are always happy when they find conflicting information. Yes. So that's how I, I was able to learn, learn. Then I met Doug Graham and we were teaching kind of the same thing and we became friends. We're hanging out. I'm hanging out with his wife. But then I started to realize, well, wait a second. I think we need some nutritional supplements in our life today because of certain things, the way our foods are being grown today by agri-industry, not by nature anymore. But he stayed with, no, nope, don't need supplements. So we started then we started to diverge in two different paths. Um, so, but basically that's where it all started and I've, I've kind of figured out the tenets of natural hygiene myself. Amazing, wow. It's amazing how you put like 40, 50 years into that five yeah. minutes, I love it. So, okay, I have some random questions now for you, Don. People always asking me about the hair. You have amazing hair. People are asking me, you know, it seems that like raw vegans lose their hair more easily. I do have a lot of people that ask me about hair. What do you recommend for somebody that is, has thinning or is losing their hair and thinks it's possibly because they went vegan or because they're raw? No, sometimes that does happen. Let me, let me explain why. Okay, when, thank you. When you go from a typical Western diet, right? That diet is a crappy diet, but it is fortified with some nutrients that are difficult to get if they didn't do that fortification process, so the program, I should say. Um, but what happens when you go to a raw vegan diet? Is any of the foods you're eating fortified? No. It, and on top of that, they're not growing in the greatest of soil. So it's ironic to think they're getting more of certain things like B12 and, and D than a lot of people are. Mm. Um, so for hair, there's copper and there's a few others. But see, the, the agri-industry growers are not putting those back into the soil. Now, if they're not, because they don't have to. They're not being forced to by government and they don't have to do it to grow crop after crop after crop after crop, so why should they? They're growing for profit first. So they don't, so, but, but there was copper in some of the things that you were eating because, or iodine is a perfect example, uh, dairy products. They use iodine to clean the vats, so you really? end up getting some iodine. Uh, wow, Not intentionally, but you get some, right? But now you go to a raw vegan diet, there's none in the soil really for most people, unless you live in Japan near the coast, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's why hair can start to go bad on you because, and other things too, because you're getting less of certain nutrients now than before. It's, like, it's totally ironic and it's not taught by a lot of raw vegans. But when I started realizing that and realizing why some people that I was counseling were going downhill, raw vegans and they come, I've been doing it four or five years and yeah. why am I going downhill now? I'm like, well, there's gotta be a reason. Let's figure this out. Yes. And it was just lack of enough of all, I always say that enough of all, enough of all the nutrients that we need. So hair is copper and a few others. So by adding daily green boost, you probably, people hear me scream about daily green boost all the time. By adding that in there, that takes care of it. That and what are you using to clean your hair? You know, what are you, what are you putting on your hair? I use a, a shampoo that only has two ingredients. It's J.R. Liggett's Bar Shampoo. It is a bar of shampoo. It does not dry your hair. It does not strip your hair. You will not need conditioner. So that's another thing wow. that's, that's good to do. Um, you don't have to, unless you live in like a polluted city where, where the air pollution is going through your hair and your hair is acting like a filter, you don't have to wash your hair every day because you're, you're, you're washing away certain oils on your scalp, which in nature we would have never done. You know, no one was shampooing their hair 100,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's like a two or three fold process. Make sure you get enough nutrients, sleep, you know, it's the other basics of health. Um, up and down activity to move your lymphatic fluid so all, all the lymph system is moving good and then you get good hair. Now my hair, uh, everybody in my family goes all white. All the males in my family go all white by age 50. Mm -hmm. Everyone, I'm snow white. Uh, but eating the way I did, I didn't. I still have a lot of, you know, my natural color hair. Um, but then, then I looked at a hair one day and it was white at the tip and black at the roots. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute. Hey, that's good. It's coming Incredible. back. And I thought it was all going to come back, but then time caught up with me. <laughs> you know, age. That's incredible. Uh, now, question, what kind of water do you drink and what kind of water do you recommend people drink? Water is a big thing. Oh, water is a big thing. It's a big controversy. Yeah. Now, if you were living 
where we lived in 100,000 years ago, you would not really need a lot of water. You being a whole bunch of water, high water content fruits, medium water content fruits, you wouldn't be working out, going to the gym, working up a sweat, doing anything, right? Uh, and you probably wouldn't need much water. Today, different story. So you A, you want water that has no chemicals in it, no trihalomethane, just, just no, gar no, no toxins or poisons. So that's how, that should be a no-brainer. Um, but how do you get this? You know, where do you get this from? If you buy bottled water in the United States, it's legal for the bottlers of bottled water, you know, spring water, half that water can be tap water, you know, municipal water. So that's not the one to buy. You can make your own from tap water and you just take that tap water, right? And you either distill it or you put it to a really good carbon, solid carbon block filter. So there's great technology today to undo the damage of the bad technology that we have. So you just gotta do something to your tap water Water. You don't have to buy it. I see people going, you know, going to Whole Foods and stores like that with their big bottles and putting it in that machine. Yes. And the machine says, "We ultraviolet it. We do this to mm -hmm. it. We pray over it." Yeah, you know, that's what the machine <laughs> says, right? And they're like, "Yeah, give me that water." You don't have to. You can make your own water. You just got to get the right technology. I have recommendations for the different water filters that exist. And me, um, if you don't want to go the distillation route. On my website, I don't sell it, but I just point you to a great company. And no, it's not an affiliate link. No, seriously, Don, thank you for all your research and everything you do. We know, we can tell it's from your heart. It's because you were born to do this. And so um, so you do distilled water then? No, no. I, I recommend distilled water for people who have cancer. I mean, oh. something really serious. Because think about what water is. Let me ask you a question. If you had to go to the airport to pick up a friend and you didn't know how much luggage he had and maybe he had someone flying with him, what would you do to your car before you left the house? Empty it. You'd empty it completely as much as you can, yes. right? Well, that's what the body does when you drink like natural spring water, healthy natural spring water. It takes the inorganic minerals that are naturally in there and just filters them out and gets rid of them because we don't really use that those kind of that form of minerals very well, mm. right? So now what are you left with? The same as distilled water. It's empty water. And what does water do in the body? It's part of blood and lymph. Big, big, big part of blood and lymph. What do blood and lymph do? Carry things like you're going to the airport to carry stuff. So that water has to be empty. So that's what the body does. It just filters out. So it does the same as distilled water. It just empties it. So it's totally empty and can carry stuff, whether mm. it's oxygen, nutrients, whatever it is. So if you have cancer, sure, spell the body the process of having to do that. Make it easier on the body. But for most people who are not dealing with cancer, you don't have to do distilled water. It's it's maybe unless you live near a nuclear power plant or something like that where you really like oh I gotta be careful otherwise a really good set of filters there should be more than one there's a, a cartridge here for a solid carbon block one here for fluoride it has to be separate and maybe throw in another one you can see all those different kind of filters and you get the triple one and you can buy them on, the, on that guy's website uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, you, and you're not gonna drink that much of it, really, but also, it's important, what do you store it in? Glass, 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 glass. Keep it glass, and what's more important than that? Keep that with you always. Because when your body whispers, water, mm -hmm. if it's not handy, you're likely to not listen. Yes, and last question, Don. Thank you so much for your time and for everything that you do and share with the world, all your knowledge and wisdom. Um, my last question is about mono meals. How do you feel about the whole mono meals versus feeding our microbiome with as much variety as possible every single day? Do you have an opinion on uh, which one is best or should we do both? What do you think? I have no opinions I have. <laughs> I talk in terms of facts. Yes, I, I love it. Because I don't want to be arguing with, I hate arguing with people. So I yeah, said, you know same. what? As a little kid or as a teenager, I said, if I just deal with facts like Mr. Spock. Yeah, I was going to say Don Spock. And logic. <laughs> Who can argue with me? So the, the deal behind mono meals is this. It's got two major benefits in it. Uh, first of all, you can have variety for your body, but just not at a single meal. You just want that variety during the course of the week and the month, right? But the, the two major benefits of a mono meal, that's a meal of just one thing, which is, by the way, how all other animals in the world eat. Okay, so you take a tip, you know, take a tip from that. You don't see rabbits making a salad too much. Yeah, you don't see, yeah. even, well, let's even talk about primates. <laughs> primates are closest to yes, us. Yes, We're yes, primate. yes. So you don't see um, the chimpanzees or bonobos gathering of all the different fruits they eat <laughs> and then coming on making fruit making salads. Dressing. Right, right, right. You don't, you don't see that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the two main advantages of a mono meal is, number one, it is the easiest meal in the world to digest regardless of what you're eating because you're not mixing it with anything. 
Because when, you, when you're hungry, right? You haven't eaten in a while, now you're hungry, you're gonna have a meal. The first thing you put in your mouth, your brain says, aha, let's see what this is. Let's see what kind of digestive environment I need, what kind of saliva pH I need. And it does that for that thing, because it assumes the next mouthful and the next mouthful and the next mouthful are gonna be the same thing. That's how we evolved, that's how we're wired. Ooh, so, yes, when, good point. so when you do that with one kind of food and then, and then you put in another kind of food that, that's in your bowl, that, that would have required a different digestive environment, different saliva pH, something's gonna give. You're not gonna have the best digestion possible. And then it gets less easy and it requires more energy. And the less energy you spend on digestion, the less you have, the more you have for healing or the less you need for sleep. You know, the less you need to replenish, you know, for recharging for sleep. Um, the other major advantage of a mono meal is the brain's database. When you eat just one thing at a meal, your brain can make a database of that food. It takes a picture, you know, visually it sees what it is, it files that away. You give it a name, MA, banana, whatever it is, files that away. And then when that first bite goes in, you know, it says, oh, it's, hey, this one's pretty high in potassium. That's pretty cool, I'll make a note of that. So days later, when you're getting low in potassium and you get hungry for calories, you know, for fuel, what's it gonna give you a Jones for? What's it gonna make you crave? The one. The one that it looks in the database and says, "Hey, banana is a pretty good source of potassium. Better than mango. Better than this. Better than that." Oh, so it goes banana, point. and that's why yeah. I eat. They call it instinctive eating. I don't like giving things names, <laughs> but that's the way all other animals eat. They eat very instinctively. They're very good at seeing which bush, which tree has the most nutritious of that one particular fruit that their brain is calling for at that time. Uh, so those are the two main advantages of mono meals. It's at the opposite end of the spectrum of the way most people eat, and I don't expect people to eat that way when they first start the raw vegan diet. Well, oh, I said it again. I said the bad thing. Did you catch what I said? I said the raw vegan diet. There is no such thing as the raw vegan diet. There's a raw vegan diet because there's seven raw vegan diets, seven different raw vegan diets. A lot of people don't know. So if you ask somebody, oh, you're doing the raw vegan diet, which one? They'll be like, what do you mean, which one? The one. But they, they, there's seven <laughs> different ones. They Some are healthier than others. You need to acquaint yourself with that. I talk about that on my website and, and on my Facebook page. Yeah, what is your website? My website is health101.org. And uh, my, my Facebook page is The Healthiest Raw Vegan Diet. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Guys, please check out his website. I will leave all of the links below because it's such an amazing collection of knowledge and your experience and your research throughout the last 50 years, um, almost 50 years. And working with raw vegans for a very long time. Uh, yes. So I know, what, I know why raw vegans fail to thrive and a lot of them do. Yeah. And, but there's reasons for it. Yeah, and Don is in really good health and he's like thriving and he's been doing this for almost 50 years. So guys, it's possible. It's not only possible, there's proof. And thank you, Don, for being in this world and showing people what is possible. And thank you for coming to the Woodstock Fruit Festival this year. See you next time. Bye, Don. Bye. Thanks.